안녕하십니까 국가수리과학연구소 산업수학혁신센터를 맡고 있는 조진환입니다 <웃음> Good afternoon, I'm 진환조, Director of Innovation Center for Industrial Mathematics which is a branch of NIMS We are lo Our center is located in Pangyo Techno Valley It is my honor to introduce Professor John O'Candon who is visiting this forum from the UK and has kindly agreed to give a NIMS Scholar Lecture on the subject of Industrial Mathematics Pure and Applied. I would like to introduce Professor O'Candon briefly in Korean. 오늘 행사 보도자료는 다음과 같이 O'Candon 교수를 소개하고 있습니다. 순수 수학 위주의 영국 수학계에서 1970년대 처음으로 산업수학 스타디 그룹을 조직하여 지난 50년 동안 유럽 산업수학의 세계적 흐름을 만들어낸 수학계의 이단화로 잘 알려진 인물이다 이렇게 소개하고 있습니다 1940년대, 40년에 출생한 오켄돈 교수님은 옥스퍼드 대학에서 박사학위를 받으셨고 1978년부터 2010년 언태까지 옥스퍼드 대학교 교수를 역임하셨습니다 유체의 역학을 비롯해서 응용 수학 및 물리학, 지구과학 분야까지 다양한 연구를 진행했으며 1999년에는 영국 왕립학회 회원으로 선출되셨습니다. 오켄동 교수의 업적은 특히 산업 수학에서 두드러지는데 성공적인 스타디 그룹 운영을 통해서 1989년 설립된 옥스퍼드 산업 응용 수학 센터 오키암에서 리서치 인 디렉터를 맡아서 산업계와 수학계의 협력 생태계를 형성하는 데 기여하셨습니다. 그리고 이후 옥스퍼드 협동응용수학센터 오캄의 초대 소장을 역임하셨으며 또한 영국 산업수학 전문 컨설팅 기업인 스미스 인스티튜트의 기술 소장을 맡으셔서 민간 및 공공 분야의 요구에 맞는 산업수학 서비스를 제공하셨습니다. 한국 산업수학 발전을 위해 지난 50년간 유럽 산업수학의 발자취를 공유하고자 오신 오켄동 교수를 박수로 맞이 해 주시면 고맙겠습니다. Please join me in welcoming Professor Okendon. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure that was a very generous introduction from Dr. Cho, but I will need to check some of the accuracy of some of his statements, perhaps. Um, it is a great honor and pleasure for me to stand here in front of a, a mathematical society. It's something I have only done a few times in my life. Each time I find it quite frightening. I asked your president if she was ever frightened when she spoke to Applied Mathematics Society. She said, no, no problem. But for me, it is always the pure mathematicians have the intellectual high ground and the applied mathematicians <laughs> and I am down here. Anyway, I am trying to make my talk, I'm afraid I cannot speak Korean, but I hope I will, by using many pictures and symbols it will be mostly understandable to you. And when I have some words, um, Dr. Cho very kindly translated them so you will see them. So. Um, this is where I, my, my objective really in the talk is to show you how much new mathematics can result from studying problems driven from industry. That's the most important message I want to get to you. So most of my talk will be describing quite a broad range of industrial problems that have led to innovative mathematics which could be published or lead to books and all kinds of mathematics which would not have existed without the industry drive. And then at the end I will say a few remarks about the challenges we face in industrial mathematics and the future. First, I must begin with, always with mathematics, I must do the definitions. Um, industry, I define any activity of social or economic value. 
So it could be anything from traditional industry, maybe manufacturing, motor cars, to banking, to medical industry, to sport, entertainment, uh, environment, just about everything. But especially these days, biological applications. Uh, now, industrial mathematics, I don't think, is just using mathematics to understand industrial problems. It must be innovative mathematics. Mathematics which is not found in the undergraduate syllabus or in the textbook. You must have some new ideas which, without that, then the subject does not exist. So, I'm now going to give you quite a few examples. I will only go very lightly and not go into much detail. So, the first examples, I'm afraid the top of the slide has gone, but it is are going to be what, concerning waves. Um, there are many, many kinds of waves, light waves, sound waves, seismic waves, which occur all the time in our lives, and many of them are very important for industry. And they have very simple mathematical models. So um, this, this is a very the simple wave equation, or if you look for waves which are purely at one frequency, omega, and you, this is a, a real wave function, capital phi, you can work with a different wave function, small phi, which satisfies an elliptic equation. But with the strong reminder, this is real, but this may be complex. And it's a very frequent situation in industry, whether it's um, optics or radar, even for acoustics, the acoustics in this lecture theater, the value of this parameter is quite large. When I am speaking to you, it is maybe 50. If it is uh, the light in this room, it may be, it would one, be one million. So you have a very interesting mathematical equation for this uh, Helmholtz equation here. And it is, a, it is an old applied mathematics trick. If k is large, you approximate phi with a phase, u, which is usually real, but not always, and an amplitude, a. If you put this into this equation, you soon find that the phase satis satis satisfies a hyperbolic equation, even though this is an elliptic equation. And this is called the iconal equation. So my first example was driven by the energy industry. And um, most often these days, in, well, in Korea, I, most of the solar energy is panels, flat panels. Is that right? But in the United States, where they have many deserts, um, you have, oh, sorry, you have back. Can't I get it to go back? No, no. Um, you have these parabo well, paraboloidal reflectors, and you will see the solar panel is at the focus of each of these parabolae. Now, the aim for solar design is to collect as much of the energy as you can, and so I've drawn a picture there as an arbitrary collector, which might be a parabola. The sun is coming in. And everything is fine. If the sun is over there, say, and the parabola is horizontal facing the sun, everybody knows that the rays which come in, those rays are the characteristics of the iconal equation. So they tell you how the light is being propagated, how the energy is propagated. They will all bounce off the parabola and pass through the focus. But these, suppose the sun is there or there. Well, what will happen then? Some of the light, will, you will you'll have a shadow behind this part. There will be a cutoff here. But will you, will you have a picture anything like this? 
I wonder how many people know the answer to that question. What happens if I draw the reflections of all these rays, as I did here, what will the picture be? Well, it turns out that if the rays, sun was coming like this from bottom to top, this focus degenerates into, well, <laughs> a green cubic curve degenerates into the focus when this angle is zero. So the, all the energy gets focused instead of at this point, it is focused in the vicinity of this cubic curve, which is called a Schienhausen cubic. It was invented a long time ago. But it's very interesting. Obviously, this part of the cubic is not relevant because you're only interested inside. But all the energy will be in the vicinity of this green curve. And that um, has quite important implications if you want to collect energy when the sun is rising or setting and not coming vertic straight in where you might put other solar panels. But the really interesting question when you, this is all in two dimensions, if you are doing it in three dimensions with the light coming at an angle, well what happens to this cubic curve? And it came as a great surprise to me to find there is the cubic curve in a cross section that the cross section of the surface of revolution for the paraboloid is um, well there are two more branches appear on this curve and I ha it's very difficult to draw not surprisingly it has a kind of a heart shaped cross section each side but the cusp comes into a point and it's very difficult to see what happens here um, I can, my student wrote and drew a nicer picture of it. If you can give you, that can give you some idea. This curve has two sheets, a red sheet and a blue sheet, and they meet in a very interesting point called a hyperbolic umbilic. Now, if you have studied catastrophe theory, you may have heard of the hyperbolic umbilic. It comes in dynamical systems and is a very difficult thing to visualize in your mind, I always find. But here is a physical realization of the hyperbolic umbilic, which is this point right at the center. And so a very simple problem like that can get you into quite interesting geometrical ideas. Now let me pursue a little further. Also with um, wave propagation and also in the frequency domain. So we are still using the iconal equation. We can still draw rays. But this is now coming from defense industry, it should say. And I drew a beautiful picture of a stealth aeroplane, but I'm afraid you cannot see it. Um, now, if we, are, if we are shining radar, as it would be for an aeroplane, or if it is just light at some obstacle, as we've seen already, you get the, the light will go straight, um, but then if it hits the obstacle, it, there should, according to the iconal equations, there are no blue lines down here. And if this was a circular, this is called a scatterer, this obstacle by the people who do scattering theory. Um, there are no blue lines down here. But in fact, there are real rays of the iconal equation which come from this point for a sharp, if you have a sharp point, they come and there is, a, there is some light in the shadow. It's small, but after some work you can show it is one over square root of K. So, and it's very important to work out how big this is because um, you see this red ray could come and then it could go on and go around and go backwards that way. So if this was part of a stealthy aeroplane, you, even though these rays are never going back to the enemy, some of these could. And the same sort of thing happens if you have a smooth boundary, except that the shadow is even smaller. It is exponentially small in K but these rays can go around and reveal your position to the person who's illuminating you. Now, that itself is a very well understood branch of mathematical physics, but 
almost all the books in physics about radar and optics, they only ever look at these kinds of pictures. They only ever assume that U, this phase function, is real. Um, but there is no reason U satisfies the gradient of U squared equals 1. There's no reason why U should not be complex. And now you have to consider the possibility of making all these lines, which are just one-dimensional in a two-dimensional space or three-dimensional space, they must now become two-dimensional because you have complex rays. And what happens... Well, I can show you give you an intuition about complex rays. Suppose you just had a circle and you had a lot of sources of light around the boundary of the circle. And so you prescribed phi, this wave function, to be, say, some harmonically varying function of the angle theta. This is a solution, well, this is just on the boundary. If you solve the Helmholtz equation, with this boundary condition, the, the blue rays that you get, you get two rays out of each point, and they form, um, you trace them round, you find that there is a region, a circular region in the middle, where there are no blue rays. The angle between these two rays and the surface is prescribed by this boundary condition. I think it's 45 degrees in this case. So, according to the iconal equation, there is no light here, and all this annulus is illuminated. But we know there will be some light in there, and um, the, the light in here is described by complex solutions of this equation. And now you have to think of these complex rays as really a four-dimensional problem now, because each ray is a two-dimensional object, and you have a two-dimensional space. So what does a two-dimensional ray, if it meets a two-dimensional space, well, it meets it in a point. And so, in fact, when you do the analysis, this whole region is full of dots. Not blue lines, but blue dots. Each of those rays, complex rays, has an exponentially small field. And that's what, that's what makes complex rays difficult. If you, um, there is the theory of uh, complex rays is only in the last 30 or 40 years as a result of the defense industry. Um, it's very similar to what happens if you do remember the error function, this function here. Well, this is really, uh, well, it's related to the error function. If z goes to infinity, this function goes exponentially rapidly to zero. If z goes to minus infinity, it goes to 2. If you look in the complex plane, the Argand diagram for z, you go to 0 that way, 2 that way, what happens when you go around? You find some very interesting changes across certain lines in the complex plane. And this was a beautiful piece of math, one of the most beautiful pieces of, well, I call it pure mathematics, really. It was invented by Stokes, the guy with the Stokes theorem, and he discovered on his wedding night, this happened, when he was getting married the next day, he was lying, he was thinking, how does this function change to this function as you go like this. And he's d he discovered there were certain lines in the complex plane, in this case 45 degrees, where the function started as 2 and then it got bigger and bigger and then it started to become exponentially large, but at the same time it gave birth to something which became exponentially small over here. And that was called a Stokes line. It was a very beautiful piece of mathematics. Um, I've drawn a little picture to help you sort of understand how that can happen by the con if you write this as a contour integral and go either in this direction or that direction. So that is now a very important piece of mathematical methodology in, in radar. Um, I, this is another example concerning total internal reflection. You know, when you look at, if, if you are a fish looking out of the water, you cannot see 
beyond a certain angle, or if you are a fisherman looking into the water, the, the light rays bend as I've drawn there, and then you come to a certain angle and everything else thereon reflects. If this is point P, this is where the complex rays live in the curve down here, which is this green curve, and there are complex rays there. But I won't go further into that. Um, but just to show you how complicated and how, what a mathematical challenge it is, if you were doing a radar problem where we were doing the shadow boundary for a smooth, for a smooth scatterer, we have this boundary which changes, I've drawn them red here, they were blue before, and there are these rays that creep around the back. If you draw the Stokes lines for that, well, this is... <laughs> This point here is the top of the circle. All these lines demarcate the different regions where different exponentially small wave fields are found. So it really does open up a very complicated and interesting branch of mathematics. Well, that's enough. My last wave problem is um, much easier to understand physically, I think, and it's very important. It was, for me, it was very important. It was when I was a postdoc, we started having industrial mathematics workshops in Oxford in 1968, if you could believe I'm that old. And um, one of the first problems was from the railway industry. I came from Seoul in a beautiful train this morning, which had on the top of it, a pantograph for collecting the electricity from the overhead cable. Now, this does not look a particularly interesting mathematical problem. They were interested in the force. On the top of this pantograph is a piece of carbon which conducts the electricity, and the carbon is drawn along as the train is going 200 kilometers, perhaps, uh, per hour, the carbon is collecting the electricity here. So to make a mathematical model of that, you might draw a picture like this, where there is the pant not, not a very good pantograph, and that I've drawn the wire, which is a catenary, a curve which hangs down and exaggerated. And you have to solve the wave equation, which I'm afraid is gone off the top of the board, but the deflection of this pantograph head. As the, pan, as the train goes along, the pantograph will go up and down. It will go up to a support and then down again, but it will always be pushing on the wire. So the train path in the x and t plane, this is x equals zero, would be a, far, a red curve going quite, quite slowly because the waves in the wire, which are elastic waves in this wire, I'm sorry, they're not on the top of the page, it's just d2y by dx squared is 1 over c squared, d2y by dt squared. Um, the, way, the characteristics are these green curves, which move slower. And this is an interesting problem, because if you are trying to solve the wave equation in a region, usually you solve it like a musical instrument or a piece of string, you have waves and you have fixed boundaries, or you may radiate to infinity as we were doing earlier, but here we have a boundary which is going faster than sound. This is a, a time-like boundary if you do hyperbolic equations. And you can see that the solution that y at, at this time here will get information along this characteristic, and so it will depend on what was going on there. So you get a differential equation for this top of where the pantograph is, so which y at time t depends on y at an earlier time, lambda t, which is tor, and lambda turns out to be this number, which is less than one, with the train going faster than sound. And this is a very interesting um, differential equation here. I hope you can read it in green. I've generalized it slightly. Just dy by dt at time t, it depends on y, um, well, and the, there is an extra coefficient from the pantograph, depends on y at lambda t. And it's a delay differential equation, 
that you're starting it at t equals naught when the train passes the support, and you want to solve it for t positive. Now, there's a great theory on delay differential equations, but they're always, almost always, in the form dy by dt is something to do with y of t minus 1 or t minus some constant. This makes a big difference. You could transform this, but then you'd start at t is minus infinity. We found no, when we wrote this down in 1971, we found no literature except in number theory. And it had been written by a guy called Mahler, who worked in Manchester in England in World War II. He'd been looking at partition problems, the, um, the numbers between 0 and 1, how many, how many solutions, oh, sorry, how many, um, for integers h naught h1, how many ways can you split it up? And then you take the limit when you take larger, finer and finer partitions. And there was one other application, I think, in astrophysics in Russia. Anyway, um, if you solve this type of equation on a computer, um, my friend Ari Isolis from Cambridge, he tried just looking at the kinds of complications you could get if he was looking at a fourth order system, he found that you, if you drew a phase plane of the function against its derivative and you, um, you may look at the phase plane on a scale, it may look like that. Then you refine the scale, it goes to something like this. Then you refine the scale, it goes to this. Then you refine this and it goes to that. You never get back to the same pattern. It's not like a fractal or anything like that. It really has incredibly interesting structure, which makes, perhaps means why, that's why it's been so widely used. Um, it has these, it's got these interesting applications in differential equations. It comes in when you do gambler ruin problems where you have, if the chance of winning is not exactly one half, you know, the one half going to one quarter introduces a lambda into the problem. And it's even been used as models for cancer therapy. So this is a problem which arose from a very small industrial application in 1971. And now there are at least a thousand papers on it in mathematics journals. Okay. Um, oh, I've, there's one other. This is the, one of my favorite problems. No mathematics. I have to write up for this. This is also really waves, but not really. Um, defense and security are increasingly important these days. And it was a defense company was building a new research building. They didn't want to know anything about the waves in the building, but they wanted each office, and all the offices were cuboidal. What is the Korean for three-dimensional rectangle? Cuboid, is that all right? So they all have vertical walls and horizontal ceiling and horizontal floor. And they want each office to, have, to be secure for radio communication. So each office has one radio frequency. But it must not have the same radio frequency as the office, the other side of the wall, or the other side of the floor or the ceiling. And the question is, if there are n offices, and they are all fitting together as cuboids, how many frequencies do you need so that you can make sure every office is secure? It's like a four-color problem, but it's in three dimensions, but it's got the constraint that you don't just color with arbitrary shapes, you have to have cuboids. Do you think that that's a problem that you could give an answer to? Um, well, it took some of my combinatorial friends a long time, about nine months, I think. They proved that um, you, it wasn't like the four-color problem. You, if, if, you, if I give you um, any number of finite number of frequencies, I can design an office building which um, needs all those frequencies, no matter how large. So it's quite different from the four-color problem. But it was a very interesting piece of combinatorics and, and geometry. Um, now, this second, this is the second part of the mathematical bit. It won't be so long. Um, 
it should say at the top there, free boundary problems. Now, as, as you will have guessed, I work mostly in differential equations, and I was very surprised at this first sentence. I hope you can sort of make sense of that. Uh, within five years of starting industrial mathematics, we found that among all the differential equations coming from industry, no less than one-third didn't have boundary conditions on prescribed boundaries. Part of the problem was to find the boundary and the boundary conditions. And the first example was very, very worrying for me. It came from the automotive industry. So in those days, well, you still do if you wish to to stick together two parts of a car body. You may have a steel plate here and another steel plate and you wish to join them. You have to what is called weld them. You have to make them so hot the steel in the center melts and then when it freezes the two pieces are glued together. And um, the way you heat is you put an uh, electrode on the top and bottom. You pass quite a, have quite a large voltage between there. And then the electrical heating will be strongest in the middle, and that will cause the steel to melt. And they wanted, in those days, a mathematical model. If you prescribe the thickness of the steel and the voltage drop, how long before the weld has reached a size which is big enough to be strong. And so it's a free boundary problem. You see, you have to solve for the temperature in the steel here and here, but you don't know, and in the melted steel here, but you don't know where to put this red curve. It doesn't necessarily, it will probably look much more like an ellipse, in fact. This is what is called a Stefan problem in that Stefan studied polar ice caps, in fact. Now, it looks quite straightforward. You just you put some, you'd say that the temperature is equal to the melting temperature of steel, and you'd have to account for, you know, when you go from solid to liquid, there is a jump in the heat flow to account for the latent heat. Well, if you do that um, as a sort of free boundary formulation, it's, we did it, and we even did it on an early computer, and whenever we did it, we found that we got this very bad result, that the temperature in the steel out here was greater than the melting temperature, as it should be less. But when we just formulated, as I said, with solving the heat equations inside the melted region, outside, and joined them together, and then it was pointed out to us by an engineer, it was not a mathematician who noticed this, that if instead of solving the heat equation in its traditional form, T is the temperature, this is just heat conduction or diffusion, Q is the heating from the electrical current, he said, nah, you don't do that with a free boundary and solve it inside and outside and join them together. All you do is you replace this by that where this function h, which has a physical significance, I won't go into that, it's a function of temperature, but it's not single-valued. It's a function which has a jump equal to the latent heat. This is the melting temperature. I should have labeled that as Tm. So you have to interpret this in the sense of distributions now. It's no god good talking about classical solutions anymore. But if you... You then have to multiply this by test functions, do all the kind of things that you do for weak solutions of partial differential equations. And when you do that, and you put the algorithm that discretizes the weak solution on the computer, it produces an answer which is completely different from this. It came as a great, we just didn't believe it. We never got this picture from that algorithm. What we got instead was that the, the melted region was not, well, it, it, it went into two parts. It had an annular region where the temperature was actually equal to the melting temperature, and then only in the center of that annular region 
did you find that it actually had gone into liquid steel? And if you didn't have this region in here, you got into that physically unacceptable situation. So that is a great triumph for mathematics, really, when you look at it. And indeed, after that, many, many papers have been written on weak solutions of Stefan problems, but it all started with the automotive industry. There's one other I can't help um, telling you about this one because you have a very strong automotive industry in Korea. So if this is part of a Kia... Or is it Hyundai? Or are they, the, are they the same? I don't know now. Suppose you are painting the car. car. Car bodies have very complicated shapes. I've drawn a smooth part here, but it could easily be a door with all kinds of convoluted shapes. And you must make sure the paint covers every part of the steel, or else it will go rusty. And so you do this typically by dipping the body of the car into an electrolyte which has got the paint, in this case red paint, which are paint molecules which carry charge. You then apply electric field and the paint goes towards the car. And it doesn't paint it all the same. It, the pieces that stick out have a stronger electric field and you get more paint. And the pieces where it's going in, you get less paint. So those, that part hasn't been painted. And this is another free boundary problem, one dimension less, but you've got to find where it's been painted. And it turns out that instead of writing down the equations for the field, which are quite easy, just Laplace's equation, but the rather complicated switching boundary condition, you switch from a Dirichlet where you prescribe the potential to a, you have a prescribed current so that the paint gets deposited. You can write it all just as a single variational statement. It's actually a, a variational inequality. And if you put that on the computer, it saves a factor of 10, at least it did in 1984. Sim it was a factor of 10 simpler to minimize this functional than it was to solve this differential equation with these boundary conditions. And it was the Ford Motor Corporation which actually took a patent out on the basis of this and saved a great deal of money. Uh, didn't help the mathematicians that much. Okay, um, that's more or less all I want to say about how new mathematics has um, arisen from industrial problems, except... Let me just, could I just mention a few more situations? I won't do any descriptions in detail. I'm sorry, it's all in English. Free boundary problems. I think or we have, the first ever conference on them was held in 1973 as a result of our experience in Oxford. And there have been conferences on them every two or three years around the world ever since then. The next one is in Shanghai in a couple of months' time. And I think at least 10,000 papers have come in mathematical journals on free boundary problems. And it's a subject which really wouldn't have existed without industry. And it's had applications in, um, well, not just in car automotive industry, but in food. Um, whenever you are cooking food, if you are making bread, for example... How do you predict the thickness of the crust? In glass, all glass has to be solidified and you have to make it very flat and parallel-sided. Metals we talked about. Um, oil recovery, oil reservoir, you want to know, the, the oil is always in some bounded region under the ground. You want to know where that bounded region is and how it evolves as you take the oil out of the ground. Um, also, forest fires make, are always, you want to know how they spread. Glaciers, free boundary problems. Cancer growth is a very, that's one of the most intensively studied. They are very much modeled as generalized Stefan problems on the macroscopic scale. Um, elastoplasticity, cavitation. The one that I most like is option pricing. And I see there are quite a lot of young people here who may be 
going to do mathematics with an eye to going into banking and making a lot of money. I hope you don't. I hope you stay and be mathematicians. But it's very nice to think that the mathematics of options pricing is almost exactly the same as the mathematics of the Stefan problem, the welding problem. At least it was before the crash. It's been updated a bit since then. And so um, that was my last statement there. So uh, I've said enough about that. Can I just spend the last few minutes talking about the challenges for the future? Um, I'll say this in English, but I hope you'll be able to. I'm not going to go too fast. Um, I, before I tell you what the challenges are, just a little bit about me. I. Um, I say I was a postdoc starting on industrial maths back in the 1960s and 70s, but we only became a serious operation in 1989 when we set up a Centre for Industrial Implied Maths in Oxford, which was quite hard work because it was there was no other such centre anywhere in the world, and people were suspicious. But since then, it's grown to be the largest research group in the Oxford Mathematics Department. So the department did quite well out of it. It has brought in probably 50 million pounds since, to Oxford since 1989. So, and that money is spent across the whole dis department. So industrial maths can be very good for maths departments, especially if they don't have too much money. And it isn't the money comes to the department, it gets spent by the department. Um, but perhaps more important from the point of view of the present day, and especially for places like NIMS, um, a friend of mine uh, founded a, an operation called the Smith Institute. I'm going to leave some pamphlets about it here. This is especially for young people if they're interested in working in an environment where you do innovative mathematics, but you do also cater for clients who have projects, who pay money for your mathematics, and you also have strong links with academe. It's a not-for-profit company. Currently, you can, you can read... Oh, one. Why isn't that translated? I'm sorry. Did you not do that, uh, Dr. Cho? Where is he? Did you translate that part? I'm not the red part. Sorry. Well, could you? Do you think you could do it? Is it e is it easy? You think, or do you, is it good enough for me to read? Or could you, would you like to translate? Okay. I, I think that everybody knows the, the meaning of. Everybody is every, if everybody is happy. <laughs> Well, I would, let me just emphasize it is not for profit. It is not like a startup company, not like Google, something where you would have sh maybe have shareholders, people wanting to make money out of your mathematics. Or it does make money, makes quite a lot. It has a turnover of three or four million dollars each year. But all that money goes into the company. And what it does with that money, well, first of all, it has to have people who who create the money, who go out to industry, maths professors and PhD students, postdocs, they can't usually, they haven't got the time or the skill to go out and do business development. But of the staff, five or six of them, they spend most of their time doing this business development. And it's very interesting, they are all women. It is very much easier for women to communicate what mathematics can do to people who are running industries who don't know much about mathematics than it is for men. It's just a, a social phenomenon. Well, women are obviously much kinder and easier to talk to, but it really does help to be female. So, more, in fact, more about 16 of the, to of the staff are female. Um, and with this money, it not only grows itself, but it, it organizes workshops and study groups. I'll say something about study groups in a moment. 
and arranges marriages between industry and academia. So industry comes with, with a problem. The Smith Institute has a scientific board, which I am involved with, and we see these problems and we can say Professor X in University Y is the right person. We can, we can arrange marriages like that. And it's had projects relate, ranging from nuclear fusion at one extreme to spectrum auctions. I don't know if any of you here have studied auction theory. It's a very interesting branch of mathematics. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, now, the main challenge on the intellectual side of the moment right now is the changing way industry is posing problems. It doesn't pose problems like how do you weld two plates together anymore. It, pros it poses air sub uh, problems coming from areas you would never have thought of. For example, I have to go to a workshop in a couple of weeks' time on the mathematics of justice. Now, I think that's a really interesting new area for mathematics. You, justice is a legal system, should be a logical system. You should be able to perhaps even axiomatic characterization, at least of certain forms of law. And I can see that that could be a really rapidly growing area of industrial maths in, the, in due course, and definitely demanding new methodologies, not different from the ones I've been talking about. Um, and this is just to back that up, really. Social, economic, political science, security, uh, pr problems coming increasingly from those areas. Just before I left, we had a um, problem from the British Transport Ministry saying what happens if, if a train has a sudden accident and the passengers have to get out of the train, how long will it take them to get out of the train? And will they be injured? Injuries. It's a very difficult problem to make a mathematical model for, but it's that kind of thing which comes to us. But this is, I've come back to auctions. Paul Klemper, well, he's a mathematical economist. He, as in the area of auctions, um, this was to do with the, um, in America, they've been selling off a lot of the TV and radio auction so the mobile phone people can buy that auction. And how much are the Mo is Vodafone prepared to pay? How much does the TV station want for its spectrum? And then to make a mathematical model of an auction, you have to, you have to divide the buyers and the sellers into different sets and you color them in different ways and you then link them, link them up. And Paul Klemperer discovered that sometimes these sets could be joined together in a way, you know, in projective geometry where you draw two lines and three points and you join them up and suddenly a line goes through everything. It was an actually interesting example of using projective geometry ideas. Very nice. Um, now that one I didn't mean to show. I'll come back to that in a minute for time. Um, let me just talk a little bit about the challenges for the actual brain power where it's coming from, the education. I don't believe um, traditional conferences like this necessarily do enough to pr promote innovative and versatile mathematics. Um, the only way you can really, I think, learn how to confront industrial problems if you are a young researcher is to do it hands-on and go to some sort of event where industry people come and bring open problems and mathematicians who are interested are just given a completely free hand over a period of usually five days to try to work out how mathematics can help them. And this is this idea of a study group, which we did. I think this was the best thing we ever did in Oxford, was to invent this idea. It was my advisor and the professor of numerical analysis. He, they invented the first study group in 1968, and they're now about 30 countries in the world have annual study groups, and I very much hope there will be a NIMS study group soon. And I think that is one of the ideas. But um, 
the problems coming to these study groups, I've, I've tried to emphasize diversification. I, I put this in, I'm afraid, because I'm coming to South Korea, but we did have a problem from the British Home Office two years ago. Britain is involved in nuclear arms treaties with America and Russia. And the actual verification that they do have the number of warheads that they say they have, you, ha you have to, first of all, um, define a team of people who are allowed to go into the building to look. And then in each room there may be some containers which may or may not contain uranium. And you can only look at one of the containers. And then you have to work out from this have they complied? Have they only got 56 warheads or whatever? Very interesting problem in game, very, quite complicated problem in game theory. I uh, hope that isn't going to be important <laughs> in Korea. So, um, though you've got to be prepared for all these kinds of things, and I say, going to a study group is the best way to do it, I think. Um, oh, no. I only uh, happened, I was fortunate enough to go to the last study group um, in the Pacific, which was in Australia and Adelaide. And there, Australia is suddenly showing very, very good intuition, I think, by the Prime Minister actually announced the traditional approach of universities, of judging them by publications, weighing the publications, and giving money according to the number of publications. Publish or perish is no longer, no longer the catchphrase. Collaborate or crumble is what he is encouraging Australian universities, not just in mathematics, to do. And so there is a, a slight swing and something in the air, something is changing. Um, and uh, now let me talk a little bit more about what's happening in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, there are many strong economies in Asia-Pacific, and as there are in Brazil, India, and Russia. But in many of these countries, getting industrial mathematics off the ground has not been easy. I've called it birth pangs. Malaysia is my favorite example. They started in 2010. The vice chancellor of their technical university, I remember him saying, it was at a meeting like this, the beginning of, a, of setting up their program, he said, we must have things which are freewheeling, we must have study groups, we must do industrial mathematics. And do you know what he said? He said, do industrial mathematics Gangnam style, he said. <laughs> Unfortunately, they have not done it Gangnam style, but you obviously could. Um, I could tell you a lot more about Malaysia if you want. Um, there's a great advantage in having pure and applied maths brought together. In the UK, we have a tradition since Newton. You can't do that here easily, but you can try to bridge that gap in, in maths departments and universities. Um, but it's the intellectual challenges that are the greatest. And as, as you've probably heard with the fourth industrial revolution, there's a strong emphasis on data and AI, I gather, stochastics. The Smith Institute recently did a survey. They thought the most important area for general industry in the UK was actually uncertainty quantification, which you may call stochastic control or something like that. I think that's certainly just as important as big data. In fact, big data may actually be a bit of a threat to mathematics because it might take money away from it. But that is my final message, or at least was going to be my final message. I think that more or less is self-evident. But let me conclude with a, with a message for, especially for the young people here. We have one Korean PhD student in Oxford who was in her third year, and she said, oh, Professor Rockin, you're going to Korea. Please, can you, send, can you take this message with you? Oh, don't, that, that's just uh, my final. I don't want that. Now, I'll leave you to read that. Please, especially the young people. The top, the top hasn't, can, what did she say at the top?
that is chopped off there. Oh. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. So she's called Jane Lee. She sends her best wishes to you all, and I hope that gives you a, a nice message. Thank you very much for listening to me. <웃음> 시간 관계상 Q&A는 따로 진행하도록 하겠습니다. 끝나고 휴식 시간에 다시 한번 박수로 오켄동 교수님께.